Hello, guys. Hi, I'm Kelly from Eloquy, and I recognize that I am the last person before lunch, and I take that responsibility very seriously. So uh, I'll keep it moving. Um, so I'm here today to talk about becoming a customer-centric organization. And I have the word listen up there, and we're going to keep coming back to that time and time again, because being customer-centric is really all about listening to your customer first. That's where it's all going to start. Um, so before I really get into the meat of it, I'll tell you just a quick little bit about myself and my company. So I'm Kelly Goldston. I'm the VP of Marketing at Eloquy, and I focus on performance marketing. So before I was at Eloquy, which I've been there for about three years, before that, I led customer acquisition marketing for diapers.com, which was a subsidiary of Amazon, RIP. It is no longer. It's very sad. Um, but I, I underscore my background in performance because this is going to be kind of a touchy-feely presentation, but I want to make sure you guys know that my job is not being touchy-feely. My job is making money, so everything I'm going to talk about today, it's, um, it has the touchy-feely to it, but we also do it because it works and it generates revenue for us. So just kind of keep that all in mind. Um, for those of you who don't know Eloquy, we are a plus-size women's apparel brand wearing Eloquy today and every single day of my life. Um, <laughs> we design original clothes for women sizes 12 to 28 and sell it on our e-commerce site at eloquy.com. Check it out. And in uh, three brick and mortar stores that we have so far in DC, Chicago, and Columbus, Ohio. Um, yeah, woo -woo, we got some Columbus in the house. Uh, <laughs> so we, uh, we're also on a fast fashion model. So we debut new styles every single day. We chase runway trends. So we're kind of like a Zara for plus size, which is not really something that the plus size industry has had a lot of before. Um, to tell you a little bit more about Eloquy, since this is a customer-centric presentation, I'm going to actually let some customers tell you for themselves. Um, and by the way, this is a customer here. Her name's Kenya. She has the most beautiful smile in the world, I think. Um, and throughout the presentation, most of the visuals you'll see will be actual Eloquy customers, just to add in an extra little punch. Um, so let's hear what some customers have to say. She's saying really good things about Eloquy right now, just so you know. Exciting, and my size, it was so unfortunate. I got trapped in wearing the same jeans because there weren't that many options. Plus size shopping was always a bit difficult before Eloquy. You kind of were used to seeing the same things in the same stores. Eloquy is interesting because it has a little bit of everything. It's really a good mix for different people, and I hadn't seen that anywhere before. I discovered Eloquy because I was going to the Kentucky Derby, and I needed some really elegant dresses. And ever since they've been like my spirit animal. I don't have to worry about the size or the fit because I just know it's gonna work and I know it's gonna be great quality. So now I dive in and I find the things that excite me. Eloquy really is the first clothing line that has allowed me to fully be who I wanna be. I'm a wedding planner, so whether it's going to a wedding, going to work, a night out on the town with my girlfriends, I can find something from Eloquy for every occasion. Whatever is hot and trendy on the runway, they have, and your size is not a problem. I don't feel like I'm reading the magazines and looking from the outside in. I feel like I'm in it. If you were on the fence about Eloquy, I'd say, don't you want to be cute? <laughs> it gives you so many options, and you get a chance to share your own personality through your clothes. And oh, P.S., look at me. <laughs> I'm cute. <laughs> That's Gina there at the end. She's one of our favorites. We love her. <laughs> So when we were going to put this video together, like everything that we do, we always went customer first. How can we do this in the most real possible way? Because I can be a talking head and tell you about Eloquy, but it's like, yeah, I'm also paid to do so. We can hire people and pay them to do so. But these were all just real customers that we flew in from across the country into our office. And it was unscripted, and we just said, like, tell us about your experience with Eloquy. And they just happened to be the most amazing, eloquent, beautiful people of all time, so, <laughs> um, so it went well. But we do use customers in marketing wherever we can, um, and that's going to be a continuing theme throughout the presentation. Mm. Oh, well, let me reference you also to one of the top philosophers of our time, <laughs> Ms. Beyonce Knowles Carter. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're going to keep coming back to this word, listen. Um, and much like Beyonce, 
I'm going to tell you it's really important to listen. And just like side note, Beyonce is my karaoke go-to. So I don't know how wild the after party is going to get, but <laughs> it's a possibility is all I'm saying. It's just a possibility. Um, but how do you know if you are really listening to your customers and if they feel heard? Well, they will tell you. So <laughs> these are all screenshots from Twitter when I just search Eloquy comma listen. Um, and these are all customers just repeatedly saying like, Eloquy is one of those brands that actually listens to you. Eloquy reacts to what we say. Um, and it's amazing, I think, how you can have a strategy internally and sometimes you feel like customers just don't get it at all. If you do it right, they know that you are paying close attention and they respect it and they feel like they're part of that conversation. And that's a huge point of pride for me and for all of us internally at Eloquy that not just that we're doing the listening, but that the customer knows we're doing the listening. So with all that as context, let's talk about three actual strategies for becoming a customer-centric organization. So I'm gonna talk about top-down listening, data storytelling, and then following through. So first of all, let's start with top-down listening. So when I say top-down listening, I mean anything that's going to successfully be integrated into your company culture needs to start at the top. It needs to start with executives. That means a lot of you in this room, maybe your bosses, have to genuinely be on board and be an active participant in what you're trying to get the rest of the organization to do. So I have my boss on the screen here, Mariah Chase, is to the right, she's our CEO, and then our creative director, Jody Arnold, by the way, they do not know that their photos are in this presentation, so don't really tell them. Um, but before I even joined Eloquy, they were already beginning um, to create an organization that was customer-centric. So I joined about six months after Eloquy launched. So I joined in September of 2014. Um, but before that, these two were already really cooking up. How do we launch a plus-size clothing brand that is connected as closely as possible to our customers and uses that information to make decisions on a daily basis? So Mariah knew from her prior ventures how important this was going to be, and she went to Jody and said, okay, I want to make sure we're staying as close as possible to customers. Any ideas on the best ways to do that? And Jody, being a creative director and having a background in apparel design, she said, I know the best people to reach out to. It's the people who make returns. Because if I want to have conversations all day that feel like a pat on the back, I can just look up my highest LTV customers and call them and have such a nice, like, loving, fun conversation every day. Um, but there's not a lot of actionable insights that come out of that when people are just fawning all over you, as fun as that may be. Um, so Jody said, I want to talk to the people who make returns. Because if someone returns a garment that they bought, there's something to be learned there. Either their expectations were set wrong, something was wrong with the fit or the quality or the fabric, or they didn't like the color, or maybe like their financial situation changed. Either way, it's something we want to know about, and it's a conversation that's likely to lead to actionable insights. So they started doing this from the very beginning of Eloquy. Every week, a list would be pulled of the top returning customers that week, and it started out with just Mariah and Jody, who would split up that list and literally just send them all emails from their personal email account and say, hey, this is Jody Arnold, the creative director of Eloquy. I see you made a return. I'd love to get some feedback from you and know how we can better serve you in the future. So one time, Jody sent one of these emails to a customer, and this was in like, I think, May 2014, um, sent a customer an email, said, I'd love to get your feedback. The customer had made about a $500 return, which is a pretty big return by Eloquy standards. I don't know, maybe by most standards. <laughs> and, uh, and the customer wrote back and was like, oh my gosh, I'm so flattered that you actually want to talk to me. Like, this has never happened to me before. I would love to give you some feedback. So they got on the phone later that day, and Jody said, okay, you made a huge return. You probably have a lot of complaints. Like, <laughs> hit me. Like, what, what can we do better? And the customer was like, oh, well, actually, I always intended to return probably about $500 worth of stuff. I bought $1,000 worth of stuff. I knew I would only keep half. But I just love everything you make so much that I couldn't narrow it down. So the intent from the beginning actually wasn't to keep it all. It was to return half anyway. So Jody's like, oh, okay, well, that's good news. She likes the clothes and everything. Do you have any other feedback for me? And the customer's like, well, actually, yeah, I have some thoughts about your UX. And I think maybe there's some friction on your mobile site that uh, could be preventing performance there in some of your digital marketing channels on mobile. And Jody's like, <laughs> Okay, 
that's very specific. <laughs> Can I ask, like, what do you do for, like, who are you? What do you do for work? And the customer said, I lead customer acquisition marketing at diapers.com, which is a subsidiary of Amazon. <laughs> so now we find out how many people were paying attention at the beginning, <laughs> because that was me. I was on the other end of that call. So this is where I, um, I pat myself on the back. <laughs> Serendipity. <laughs> Finding something good without looking for it. Um, Jody wasn't looking to hire the first marketer at Eloquy, but she ended up doing so after that phone call. Um, and it's because it was someone like Jody on the phone and not an entry level associate, not a customer service representative, someone who could really say, like, wow, like you are an amazing customer and you're really plugged into this world and you're actually somebody that we would love to have on the team. So after that call with Jody, I ended up having conversations with the rest of the team, and I left my job at Amazon and joined Eloquy a couple months later. So I don't know. <laughs> I hope they would all say it was finding something good. For me, it was finding something good. That's, that's definitely for sure. Um, but what's important about this to me is not just that I got a job, which is also great, um, but it's that by starting with Mariah and Jody, starting with the people at the top, They've created a culture where everyone does this every week, and it's a huge part of what we do. So this program continues today. In fact, I just emailed my three customers yesterday that I got assigned. Um, every week, the everyone in the company who feels that they can successfully have a conversation with a customer, sometimes it's not every tech person, no offense tech people. <laughs> sometimes they're like, you don't want me to have that conversation, it's not gonna go well. Um, so everybody gets assigned those return customers and we have those conversations every week. And people take it seriously because Mariah and Jody took it seriously. So top-down listening is really where customer centricity starts. Next we're going to talk about data and data storytelling <laughs> specifically. Um, so everything I just talked about was one-on-one -on -one conversations, right? And I'm sure everybody's like, okay, how many of those can I possibly have a week? Well, there's good news. Um, you only have two ears, but you have infinite data points. So there are stories that your customers are already telling you every single day that you're just not listening to because they're buried in the data. So how do you take the data and surface the right insights so that you can say like, oh wait, there's something happening here, whether it's in transactional data, um, if you're looking at Google Analytics, if you're looking at people's paths through the site, those are all stories that they're trying to tell you about their experiences. And you can learn a lot from those. And sometimes surfacing the right stories then point you to who are the people you should be having the one-on-one -on -one conversations with. So you're not having those like useless, everything is great phone calls, but you're having the phone calls where people are really telling you things that you can change in the organization. So I've got a couple stories here. One I call the white dress conundrum. It's my dramatic title. Uh, so uh, speaking of looking at returns, we were looking at return data one day. We always look at it by category to say, what categories have the highest return rates? How can we use that to forecast future return rates? Things like that. But we, we wanted to go a step deeper and look within categories and try to understand, are there subgroups of products that have higher return rates than other products? And what can we learn from that? And one thing that popped right away is that white dresses had a much higher return rate than other dresses. And this was very odd. We also noticed, uh, because we look at how everything correlates, right? Usually, a high return rate um, can correlate with a low LTV. You make a big return after your first purchase especially, something maybe didn't go right, and you might be less likely to make purchases in the future. With white dresses, after people return white dresses, which they do so at a high rate, um, they tend to kind of go quiet for a couple months, and then they resurface and come back with a really high LTV. So we're like, okay, this is very odd what's <laughs> happening here. So we identified a lot of actual buyers of white dresses who had returned them, and they became our call list for the next couple of weeks. Um, and we uh, got on the phone with them and said, like, okay, fill in the blanks, tell us what's happening. And we had a couple of theories. One theory was, you know, plus-size women are always, have historically been told, like, wear all black because it's slimming and white makes you look fat and God forbid, you know, because every, every day you should get dressed to look as skinny as possible. Like that's, those have been the rules. And so we were like, oh, I hope that's not why people are returning. I hope people aren't getting the dresses, trying them on and thinking like, I look fat in this. That, that would be heartbreaking to us. So we hope that's not the case. We also hope it's not a quality issue because maybe the white somewhere along the way got dingy or something. Like that would be awful too. Um, so 
I did one of those calls um, while we were doing this, and it was a woman named Erica. And anytime I do a return phone call, I kind of like gear myself up to be yelled at a little bit. <laughs> Because you're kind of asking for it. You know, if you're trying to find people who have had issues, so you kind of like do a little breathing exercise and think like, okay, I can take this. And I get on the phone with Erica and she's like, oh my gosh, when I saw your email, I was so excited. Eloquy is my favorite brand in the world. I love you guys so much. You mean so much to me. And I'm like, cool. So you returned a lot of stuff though. <laughs> and, and I asked her why and she said, well, I was buying my wedding dress. And I was like, your, like your actual wedding dress, your wedding day dress? And she was like, yeah, I was having kind of a casual afternoon winery wedding. I didn't want a huge ball gown. You guys have by far the best white event dresses. So things like this that are nice, but are, I mean, they're not a ball gown, you know? Um, and she said, so I went on, I bought every white dress you have. <laughs> and then I kept one. And she's like, actually, let me send this to you right now. And I was at my computer and she was at her computer. And she sent me a photo from her wedding day. And it was her in an eloquy white dress. And she was just beaming and looked so gorgeous. And she was like, so I love eloquy so much because you guys were with me on my wedding day. Like, you were right there. And I'll remember that for the rest of my life. And I'm just thinking like, oh my gosh, wow, I thought I was going to get yelled at. <laughs> and instead, like, this is so amazing. And we actually heard this story time and time again. So white dresses were getting returned so much because women were looking for a more casual, maybe daytime wedding dress option, or a rehearsal dinner dress option, bridal shower, things like that. And there's not a lot of those options in the plus size market right now. So they were coming to Eloquy, buying as many as they could, returning most of them, hence the high return rate. Then, because they were focused on their wedding, they weren't really doing a lot of other apparel shopping over the next couple months, hence the lull in activity. But then when they came back, their emotional connection to Eloquy was so high Hence the skyrocketed LTV after a couple months. So it all made sense after we started talking to them. But in order to get there, first, we had to see the initial story in the data. And then second, we had to fill it in with qualitative information. So it's both parts are equally important there. We never would have known who to call to get the right story until we found the trend in the data first. Um, the other piece that goes along with this is, Separately, we did a churn analysis earlier this year. We were just wondering, like, why do customers churn? You know, when customers disappear, what are the primary reasons and what can we learn from that? Um, we had initially tried to do some outreach around this by finding customers who hadn't shopped with us in 12 months and reaching out and saying, you know, via email saying, we'd love to have a call with you. The response rate was almost nothing because they're gone by that point. So they don't really have a vested interest in giving you feedback. Um, and they were not interested in giving us feedback. So we had like something like half a percent response rate, which makes that outreach very inefficient and difficult to scale. Um, so instead we said, okay, we have a tool that can help us do this in a smarter way. And that tool is called Castora. So I don't know, how many people are Castora customers in the room? Okay, so we got a lot, so you guys can do this too. Um, so Castora has this amazing churn prediction algorithm. So you can actually go in and say at the customer level, what percentage likely are you, an individual buyer, to churn? Um, and it's not just looking at like, have you already done it? Are you already gone? Have you already given me the signs? It's saying you are exhibiting signs that people exhibit long before they churn, so I think you're going to. So we use this algorithm to go through and identify people who Castora thought were very likely to churn, but who had not yet churned. So we still had an opportunity to talk to them. Um, we took that and bumped it up against a few other things like email opt-ins and a few um, other parameters we wanted to add. And we got 2,000 people out of this. And we were like, okay, that's a lot, but we can handle it. So we literally divided 2,000 customers among the entire organization. We have about 100 people at Eloquy now. And, uh, and we personally emailed them all over two weeks. Um, out of those personal emails, we had about a 10% response rate. So compare that to like half a percent response rate when we did our old, like you have already churned approach. So out of that, then we got 200 people responding to us with detailed feedback. And the feedback ranged quite a bit, but we were able to group it into several areas. And I can't reveal all my secrets to you, but I will say that based on that feedback, we actually changed the way we fit our garments. There were a few recurring pieces of feedback that we said like, 
okay, you know what, we can do something about that, and we made some adjustments to how we work with our FIT model. Um, we also changed some of our QA processes when there were recurring comments um, that correlated with one specific factory, and we thought, like, okay, we can do something about this. So we had real changes that we made to our business, and it was based off of knowing who to talk to, once again. So this is where we really lean on data a lot internally. Not for every piece of information, but for the information on where we should dig in more, because that's what takes so much time and where we really need to prioritize our time. So now let's talk about following through. So you've been listening to your customers, you've been becoming more customer-centric as you figure out what they need and want. What are you gonna do about it? Um, and I'm gonna say you have to put your money where your mouth is, and you have to show the customer in very clear and obvious ways that you're listening to her and that you wanna lift her up and hero her and tell her story. So almost all of our content on Eloquy is customer-centric content. We actually launched this e-magazine called Style and Substance, um, I think it was like 18 months ago now. Um, and every month we choose a real customer and we fly her into our office and she is our muse for the day. We do a full photo shoot with her, hair, makeup, the whole glamour treatment. She models our latest collection and we tell her story. So we talk about her and we choose people who we think will be inspiring to the rest of our customers. Because one thing about plus size women is we don't really have a lot of plus size heroes to look up to. You know, if you pick up the average magazine, women don't look like me. And so for me to be able to go, even just on my own site, I see this every day and I'm still inspired by it. When I look at this and I say like, okay, like Mindy Scott at the top right, like gosh, she looks amazing. And she's, this, she's a wedding planner, she has her own business in Chicago, she is a total boss, she volunteers on the weekends, she's somebody I can really look up to and she looks more like me. And that means something to me, it inspires me. Um, Ati Williams in the middle here, she's the host of DC Flippers on HGTV. I don't know how many uh, HGTV guilty pleasure kind of fans we have in the audience. <laughs> I, I definitely see some. Um, but Ati Williams is amazing and I love reading her story and she's so stylish and cool and she actually decorated one of the conference rooms in our office which was a total added bonus. And then you have Rachel Bohm down here. Rachel has Down syndrome. We found out about her when her family sent us a photo of her going to um, an adult prom for adults with disabilities. And she was wearing Eloquy. And they sent us an email with a photo of her and said, you have no idea what a bright spot it has been for her to get dressed every day and to really love what she's wearing. Because she's feminine and she's a girly girl. And she wants to enjoy that part of her day. And Eloquy has made such a huge difference for her in her confidence. I mean. Ugh, like I'm gonna cry now. So I love all of these women, our customers love all of these women, but like I said in the beginning, you know, we're not a nonprofit organization. Uh, these are touchy-feely stories, and they clearly, I hope you can feel how much they touch me, and I hope they touch you too, but we also do them because they work, not just because they're the right thing to do. So when we look at users of our site who engage in customer-centric content, they spend twice as long on our site, and as we all know, like time is money. Every extra second I can get you to spend on my site, even if you don't convert on that visit, that's more bond that we're building, that's affinity, that's likelihood that you're gonna come back. Every second counts. Con they convert at rates a full percentage point higher, and their AOVs are 15% higher. So basically on every metric, if you engage in our customer-centric content, you become a better customer. So again, we do it because it works. So just parting thoughts here, when I think about customer centricity, it really does come down to listening to your customer and reacting. Um, it starts at the top. So you have to have executives on board because for the organization to really believe this and buy into it, it can't be something that a small committee of people are trying to make happen. Everyone needs to hold hands and say, this is critical for us and we're committed. Data mining can be a form of listening. So I know somebody asked earlier, like, who has more than three people devoted to data? <laughs> it was not a lot. I don't have more than three people devoted to data um, exclusively. But every single person in my company believes in the power of data and has data as part of their jobs because we all know that data helps every single one of us be more efficient um, in what we do every day and more effective. We're better at our jobs when data helps us make the right decisions. 
And then it's all lip service until you follow through. The follow through is the most important part and showing customers, like I'm here, I'm listening to you and what I'm putting in front of you is there for a reason. It's because you told me you wanted it, not because I thought I could trick you into doing something because of it. And of course, you know, it all comes back to Beyonce. <laughs> I mean, she's saying you should have listened. So I hope everybody feels inspired to listen to their customers and take action because of it. I'm happy to take questions if I have time. Um, and even if I don't, feel free to reach out to me personally. Thanks, guys. Should I do, do I have time for questions? Anybody? I mean, it is lunchtime. So it's great that you are so focused on listening to customers, but how do you know which ones to listen to? Not all of them created equal. Oh, so true. Um, so I think everybody heard the question, how do you know which customers to listen to? Um, well, I mean, one thing I would caution is, I just talked about a lot of individual conversations. A sample size of one could be very dangerous. It's easy to have one conversation and everybody get really caught up in the moment and say like, this is it, this is our new everything and we're gonna follow it to the exclusion of all other information. It's very easy for that to happen. I think that's why for us having a combination of data and qualitative conversations are so important because data can A, tell you which people you should talk to in the beginning and then after you have those conversations, you can kind of circle back to the data again and use the data to validate and check against what you're hearing. Do other metrics support the stories that you're hearing? And then as you implement the learnings from those conversations, you can also use data to check, is it making a difference? You know, wherever possible, of course, we want to A-B test everything we do. Where it's not possible, we look at pre and post lifts um, after we take activity in the business. And we're always looking for data to help us understand, like, did we actually do the right thing? Because the second you stop questioning it is the second you start making mistakes. Yeah. Um, that was a great question. So it's after you talk, after you have an individual conversation with someone, how do you circle back to that customer and make sure that they know that they were heard? Um, it's a few different ways, I would say. Those conversations we have with customers, we form a lot of close individual relationships. So I probably personally have maybe 50 Eloquy customers that over the last three years I have become kind of pen pals with. And they email me, they love to talk. I mean, the the Customers who like to give feedback like to give it all the time. So they email me a lot with good and bad thoughts and I email back. There, um, anyone who we have a conversation with gets added to um, all of our event lists. So whenever we're having an event anywhere near them, they're automatically on the invite list, even if the event is actually intended as like a blogger preview or something like that. They're always included because they're a VIP. Like they gave us information, we wanna make sure they feel valued. Um, so there's individual responses back. There's larger scale things like being on event lists. We also have a group of customers that we call the eLab. And that's a group of about 100 customers who have given us um, consistent and strong feedback over the years that we think are really important voices. And they actually, we have a Facebook group <laughs> that they all live in um, that we talk to them through the Facebook group. We give them polls. Um, like recently, well I guess like last year we were trying to evaluate if we should do a certain design or collaboration. Um, and we had some concerns about is there something that could upset certain customers. You know, there are a lot of sensitivities around things like this. And we went straight to the eLab and asked them and got a lot of great information back that they were like, oh no, actually your concerns aren't our concerns at all. So we would love to see that. We're like, oh, okay, great news. Um, so it's in a few different ways, but um, I think it really comes down to a lot, making sure that the conversations we have are really human to human, and that if I'm talking to a customer, I'm thinking of her as a real person who's gonna wanna hear back from me, um, who I wanna hear from again, and who I wanna make sure I remember things about because she's somebody who's given me a great gift of feedback, and I really wanna honor and respect that. Anybody else? I think it might be food time. Thanks guys, appreciate it.